Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Postural Orthostatic Tachycardia Syndrome, Overview and Focus on Non-Pharmacological Approaches. This is Haley Culleton from Inside Scientific, and I'm very pleased to be your host for today's event. During today's webinar, sponsored by Finipress Medical Systems, Dr. Satish Raj and Kate Bourne from the University of Calgary will deep dive into the hemodynamic effects of compression in individuals affected by postural tachycardia syndrome, or POTS. We are now being joined by Eric Altena, Managing Director of Finipress Medical Systems, who would like to say a few words. Thank you, Haley, and thank you, Inside Scientific, for hosting this webinar. I would like to welcome all attendees to join the webinar. Finapress Medical Systems aims to contribute to better healthcare by providing hardware and software solutions for continuous non-invasive blood pressure measurements. We are delighted that with this, web with this sponsorship, we can contribute in spreading important knowledge about POTS, diagnosis and treatment strategies. Many of our customers are working on the research and diagnostics of POTS. We encourage all the work that is being done in the autonomic testing labs by many specialists all over the world. And we would like to support you all by sharing further knowledge about POTS. Today, we have two speakers from the University of Calgary, Dr. Rush and Ms. Bourne. Dr. Rush's primary research work relates to understanding and better treating POTS, vasophagal syncope and orthostatic hypertension. He is conducting studies into the role of autoantibodies and inflammation in POTS and the understanding the brain fog of POTS. Ms. Bourne is a PhD candidate at the University of Calgary's Cummings School of Medicine under the mentorship of Dr. Rush. She is primarily focused on patient-oriented research. And as a recipient of the prestigious 2020 Venue Scholarship, there is no doubt that Ms. Bourne is a highly successful scholar. I would like to give the word to our speakers now to start this webinar about POTS, an overview and focus on non-pharmacological approaches. Dr. Rush, the virtual floor is yours whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you, um, Eric. So welcome everyone. Uh, it's an honor to uh, be able to chat with you over the next little bit about postural tachycardia syndrome or POTS. And really our focus today is gonna be uh, providing a fairly broad, fundamental, basic overview of, of what POTS is, um, how it presents, uh, what may cause it, we'll touch on that a little, not in too much detail, but we're not gonna get into all of the nuanced treatment approaches, but rather we wanna highlight uh, some recent work uh, that's just been published, uh, led by Kate, on looking at some novel, uh, non-pharmacological and, and relatively inexpensive treatments that can, that can help. Our disclosures are uh, shown here. Um, of note, none of this uh, directly has to do with POTS in terms of any financial conflicts anyway. So the goals uh, for the next short while are first to review the diagnosis, epidemiology, and etiology of postural tachycardia syndrome. Um, and then Kate will take over and actually review a recent uh, study. This largely a proof of concept study, but one that's fundamental to showing the utility of compression and building on some of the physiologic work that we've done. So the Current criteria for POTS are, have been tweaked, but largely unchanged from uh, a little over 25 years ago when they were defined by uh, Philip Lowe at Mayo and uh, his fellow at the time, Ronald Schondorf, uh, an eminent uh, neurologist from uh, Quebec, Canada. And they had described a cohort of patients that hadn't been described quite in this way before who had um, a combination of, of features um, that were unique at the time. Um, so one, the hallmark really is that this group of patients had an excessive orthostatic tachycardia um, based on some data of what they thought was upper limit of normal and 
standard deviations above that, they basically used a cutoff of uh, an increase in heart rate from lying to standing of over 30 beats per minute. Um, one of the challenges with using orthostatic tachycardia is it's a moving target. Um, there's good data that physiologically this changes with age, decreasing very high when we're young and decreasing as we get older. And so they'd actually done some further work uh, in the next generation, if you will, where they went into the schools and found a lot of healthy teenagers met this criteria. And so the criteria have been tweaked so that in patients under the age of 18, an increase of at least 40 beats per minute is required. Importantly, this has to be in the absence of orthostatic hypotension. If the only time the heart rate is going up is in response to orthostatic hypotension, then we just call this orthostatic hypotension. The key to POTS is that it's different. It, it's a group that didn't fit into that uh, prior rubric. So, so far, what I've described is POT, postural tachycardia or postural orthostatic tachycardia. It's physiology. The key to POTS is the S. It's a clinical syndrome. And for that, these patients have to have orthostatic symptoms. Not all the symptoms are worse with upright posture, but a preponderance of their symptoms and their well-being has to be uh, diminished and worsened when they're upright and get better when they're lying down. This is fundamentally an orthostatic disorder. And finally, this has to be chronic. Um, those of you who've had a bad cold or a flu um, will know that a lot of the symptoms that I'm going to talk about are things that you would experience when you're sick. And in fact, if you want to do an experiment on yourself the next time you're feeling really miserable, you could actually try and measure your heart rate and blood pressure lying and standing, and you may well meet the criteria. It's part of the autonomic nervous system's adaptation um, to the hemodynamics when you're unwell. The difference with this group of patients is that while in your case that should go away within a few days or a week, in these patients it doesn't. Um, and so there's a requirement for chronicity. And we've used six months here. I think some of the more recent guidelines have used three months. That probably makes little difference, but you don't want to be diagnosing POTS a week or two after an illness because there's a high likelihood that's going to go away as the acute illness resolves. This list of symptoms that we see in POTS is, is far from complete. Um, it's just some very common symptoms, and I've broken it as a cardiologist into symptoms that I could easily blame or attribute to the heart on the left, and symptoms on the right that I have more trouble blaming directly on the heart. The ones in black on the top are symptoms that do get worse with upright posture, but in blue on the bottom, there are some symptoms that are uh, bad without regard to position. So uh, some of the cardiac ones are things you'd expect. You'd expect uh, with the tachycardia, a sensation of the rapid heart beating tachycardia palpitation. Um, patients will often describe a chest discomfort. Often it's sharp and not the pressure that we associate with sort of an ischemic pain. Um, the cause of this isn't fully understood. Patients often describe shortness of breath, again, worse with upright posture, often associated with the tachycardia, but not always, um, and a lightheadedness. On the non-cardiac side, patients will describe commonly uh, mental clouding or brain fog, an inability to think. And this can happen in any body position, but it does seem to be worse with upright posture. They lose their train of thought. They have trouble remembering very common basic things. And this can be to the point of causing an inability to function. Headaches, very common. Probably over 90% of patients that I see complain of some form of headaches. Most complain of migraines. I'm quite frankly not smart enough to diagnose the precise cause of headaches, but I, I can tell you they have headaches. Nausea is an interesting symptom because it's uh, common, but there are actually two types. There's some patients that get nausea related to eating and meals, um, and they may have more gut issues, but there are also other patients whose nausea is positional. And in some cases, this nausea will, will respond to treatment of their orthostatic tachycardia or other hemodynamics. And then a lot of patients describe an inner shakiness or tremulousness that's worse with upright posture. At the bottom, you'll see there's some symptoms that really aren't positional. Exercise intolerance is almost uh, universal. And by exercise, I don't mean training for an ultra marathon. Uh, this could be as simple as doing things around the house, trying to walk the dog, um, just the day-to-day -day things that most of us take for granted. Grocery shopping is, is a tough stress. Um, patients are universally fatigued. Um, I'd say chronically fatigued, but that's obviously a loaded term because of chronic fatigue syndrome. A colleague at Vanderbilt uh, several years ago looked at the cohort of patients there 
and try to map it to the CDC criteria of the time uh, for chronic fatigue syndrome. And it was about half met criteria for chronic fatigue syndrome. But about 100% describe chronic fatigue. And sleep complaints are very, very common. This is a tilt table test uh, demonstration just to show you what we're dealing with. You have a POTS patient on the left and a control subject on the right. Heart rate uh, channel on top. The middle channel is a continuous blood pressure. Um, and the bottom is the tilt angle, just so you can see when the table went up and then the table came back down. If you look at the control panel on the right, this is a healthy subject. This is a Vanderbilt grad student. There are a couple of things to take from this. The first is that the heart rate went up with tilt. So orthostatic tachycardia is not abnormal. Excessive orthostatic tachycardia is abnormal. Orthostatic tachycardia is a normal physiologic response to standing. We all get it to some extent. If you look at the blood pressure and compare between the control subject and the POTS patient, I think what you can see is that it's hard to argue the average blood pressure is different in the POTS patient than the control subject. POTS is not fundamentally a disorder of orthostatic hypotension. I think the careful observer would argue that the blood pressure tracing looks different in the POTS patient than the control subject. My family has argued that it looks a lot like I do when I wake up in the morning in desperate need of a haircut with spikes all over the place. But, and that actually might actually be quite important in terms of understanding some of the physiologic adaptation that the body is going through to try and maintain the blood pressure. But the average blood pressure that you'd get from just a single recording, not different. But if you look at the heart rate at top, the POTS patient heart rates go up like the control, but they go up a lot more. These patients are overachievers when it comes to raising their heart rate. And it went up excessively and it kept going up for the duration of the tilt. And I'll tell you, this study it was meant to be 30 minute tilts um, and we'd go until the protocol ended. And in this case, the patient actually had to stop it early. So the protocol didn't end, the patient said she'd had enough. And when she said stop, her heart rate was almost 180 beats per minute. And all we had done was tilt her up. Now, I mentioned earlier that the key to POTS is the S. It's the symptoms, the syndrome part. So in this study, we were actually getting patients, uh, volunteers, to rate their symptoms every few minutes. Um, if you look at the control subjects in black, they basically had no symptoms until they did. They had a little bit of symptoms, and then that person would faint, and then they'd drop out of the data collection. And so they grumbled along at a low level. The POTS patients, on the other hand, from the time we tilted them up, they felt unwell, they became very symptomatic, and they would tell me they're about to faint. And those symptoms continued to get worse through the tilt. And in fact, the POTS patients would keep telling me they were about to faint for the full 30 minutes. Interestingly, in the study, and I am not showing the data here, but if we looked at the number of people in each group that made it through the full 30 minute tilt, a higher percentage of the POTS patients made it through the 30 minute tilt than our control subjects. The control subjects, there was a slightly higher rate of fainting where they fainted before they got to 30 minutes than in the POTS patients. So the lesson from this is that POTS isn't primarily a fainting disorder. It's a feeling faint disorder. So they feel like they're going to faint, but it's not primarily about the fainting itself. The physiology is a bit different. So uh, about one year ago, um, the Canadian Cardiovascular Society published a position paper on postural uh, orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. And we included a rubric uh, to include other disorders of chronic orthostatic intolerance. Um, importantly, this is available uh, as open access. Uh, so there's some slides and uh, figures from this that, that you can all access if you, if you want. One of the things that we realized is that there was a problem with the diagnosis of POTS in the community. Um, the criteria, as I mentioned earlier, really haven't changed a lot in 30 or 40 years. But we really wanted to emphasize that the diagnosis of POTS requires both an excess of orthostatic tachycardia on the y-axis and a prominence of symptoms on the x-axis. So the patients with POTS are really in the top right bit here. But we do see a lot of patients that have symptoms of orthostatic intolerance but don't have excessive orthostatic tachycardia. And what we're finding is that they were sometimes being diagnosed with POTS mainly because uh, 
there was a, you know, their symptoms are real and there was a need to validate that there was something wrong. But that conflates the issue when we're trying to understand the natural history of POTS or the treatment of POTS. And so we came up with uh, an alternate nomenclature. Uh, it may or may not be the best nomenclature, but we basically came up with a diagnosis of postural symptoms without tachycardia to try and account for that. And similarly, there are patients um, with uh, tachycardia or excessive orthostatic tachycardia that don't meet POTS criteria. And that might be because there's a clear secondary cause or there's a clear potential other cause, be it drugs, be it prolonged bed rest, that would preclude the diagnosis of POTS. Um, but again, they do have the tachycardia for now. And it's not an issue of saying because you don't have POTS, you have nothing, but you don't meet the criteria for POTS. And so we came up with the term for that, which was postural tachycardia of other causes. And then finally, the other thing we did is to try and recognize that um, POTS patients that we see um, often have other uh, non-cardiovascular involvement, comorbid diagnoses, other major problems that may be the driver of a poor quality of life outside of the issues related to cardiovascular control and tachycardia. Um, and that was leading to a problem in nomenclature in the literature. Uh, where people were referring to both as POTS or not referring to the other one as POTS at all, saying it's not POTS because you have these other things. And so we came up with the term POTS and POTS plus to account with the plus accounting for some of these other issues. And similarly with postural symptoms without tachycardia, they can have that with or without some of these other um, comorbid issues that we'll touch on. So for POTS plus, and as I say, this is analogous to the postural symptoms without tachycardia plus, um, this slide lists some of the other issues that may push patients into this category. Um, there are patients with GI issues, either very severe constipation, not a little bit constipated, but obstipated. Um, there are patients with gastric emptying problems, um, which if bad enough, in some cases require um, feeding tubes or even TPN. There are patients with very severe headaches where that's the primary problem, not some of the other orthostatic issues. Um, and there are some patients with a very strong uh, set of issues along the allergic spectrum um, that may be labeled as having a mast cell activation syndrome. Um, and some of those uh, have names as comorbidities uh, shown here on the right side, and, and some of those don't. And again, the reason to do this is that if we want to be able to look at this group of patients and see how they respond to treatment or see what the natural history is, we need to understand um, who that group is in a less heterogeneous way. And that was the goal. So a couple of years ago, we um, started a project um, when I was still at Vanderbilt uh, that we colloquially called the Big Pot Survey. It's actually more formally called the Diagnosis and Impact of Postural Tachycardia Syndrome. And it was really done in collaboration with Dysautonomy International, a large POTS patient advocacy group, to try and understand the patient perspective uh, of living with POTS, and also to try and get a snapshot of what POTS look like in the community. And the challenge is that I worked at tertiary care referral centers and researched POTS for much of my professional life. Um, but there's certainly the possibility that the patients that are feeling ill enough to come to hang out with me and participate in my studies may not be reflective of the broader population. And so this was uh, thought to be a more democratic way to get uh, content and information. So we'll share a little bit of the data from this. There's, there's more to come. Um, one of the, the first things is, is the who they are. So POTS patients are uh, overwhelmingly female, over 90% female. Um, in this survey, and that matches what we found in prior studies, and overwhelmingly white. Um, again, the limitation of this study uh, is that it was in English. Um, Dysautonomy International is international, but largely American-based, and 90% of our respondents were from the U.S. So perhaps that there's that limitation. But this finding of it being predominantly uh, white women in the Western Hemisphere is actually consistent with other studies from single sites. If we look at when the POTS symptoms develop, the most common age or the mode was 14 years old. 
Now, a little over half the patients de describe their symptoms as starting under the age of 18, and just under half, it started just over the age of 18. It started over the age of 18, not necessarily just over. So the point is, there's actually a spectrum, and this reflects the heterogeneity of POTS and how these may represent different populations and different underlying etiologies that may require, in the future, hopefully different targeted treatments. We had a laundry list of symptoms that we allowed patients to uh, endorse or not. Um, and the common ones, uh, most common ones are shown here. And, and at the top are things you'd expect, lightheadedness, tachycardia, presyncope, um, all well over 90%. But then we had some of these non-cardiac symptoms, headaches over 90%, difficulty with concentration and memory over 90%, nausea over 90%. So again, this just emphasizes that POTS isn't all about the cardiovascular presentation. There are significant non-cardiovascular manifestations, and we really need to get a better handle on what that means and why that is. We asked about uh, other comorbidities. Uh, you saw a slide of things that it could be uh, a few slides ago. Um, this just highlights some of the uh, things that came out of our survey. So 30% uh, of patients describe problems with their bowels in terms of irritability. Migraines had been diagnosed in these patients uh, in about 40%. Um, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, 25% reports having been diagnosed with that. Now, this started uh, several years ago before the latest uh, incarnation of criteria, so take that for what it's worth, but somewhere in that spectrum is probably about right. Interestingly, only 13% have been diagnosed with vasovagal syncope. Again, POTS is a uh, feeling faint disorder as opposed to primarily a fainting disorder. So uh, one of the challenges is that many colleagues that don't see a lot of these patients, uh, you know, very quickly sort of dismiss POTS as, uh, you know, or POTS patients as being crazy. Um, and so we actually looked at this, and this was done at Vanderbilt uh, on our clinical research center. Um, and the study was actually led um, by my wife before she did her psychiatry training. She was a research fellow with the psychiatry group there. And they administered a very structured uh, tool called a SCID, which mapped, uh, it's a structured interview that mapped to, at the time, the DSM-4TR, so the Diagnostic Bible and Psychiatry. They're on version five something now. Um, but there are two important findings. One is that some POTS patients did actually have psychiatric disorders. But it turns out that's actually pretty common in the general population, that a certain percentage of the general population has psychiatric illness. But there was not a higher incidence or prevalence, I guess, was cross-sectional of either major depression, anxiety, or panic disorder compared to the general population. So there was a low level, but it wasn't higher than you'd expect if you just picked a similar number of people out of the crowd, so to speak, and assessed them. They also administered uh, a series of psychometric tools, most of which weren't that exciting with this one exception. And this was from the Connors Attention uh, Adult, sorry, Connors Adult Attention Deficit Rating um, Score, I believe, maybe uh, misquoting the name a little bit, but basically it's an ADHD rating tool um, looking at inattention here. And what you can see here is that um, the ADHD patients scored very highly uh, and the normals in black scored the lowest. Now, it's worth noting that these normals were uber normal. So these were patients or volunteers, actually, that were screened to rule out psychiatric illness. And my wife actually very gleefully told me that I would not have qualified. Um, so take that for what it's worth. But because of that, we actually also looked at a background population on the far right here in gray, which represented published data on the general population, probably a U.S. population. Importantly, the POTS patient shown here in red had a greater level of inattention than both the normals, but also than the general population. A statistically higher level of inattention, although not as much as the group with ADHD. What about quality of life? So this is not our data. This uh, is data from published literature using the SF36. So many of you are probably familiar with the SF36, but for those of you who are not, it's a very generic quality of life tool. Um, it's not really designed to pick up specific uh, impacts in a specific disease, but because it's generically used, the beauty of it is that there are data in just about every disorder 
uh, available using this standard tool in the published literature. And so the data here are for two disorders that are generally recognized as having a very poor quality of life, um, specifically patients with chronic back pain and, and patients on uh, hemodialysis due to end-stage renal disease. And in red here are the data for our POTS patients. So this doesn't speak to why. It doesn't speak to whether the concerns are legitimate or not. What this says is that for whatever reason, patients with POTS have a very poor self-reported quality of life. And that's the way we report quality of life from every study. It's always self-reported, right? And the numbers actually are analogous to those patients on dialysis. So this begs the question of why. Why do these patients have POTS? And um, one of my favorite quotes uh, related to this uh, comes from David Robertson, my, my mentor during my time at Vanderbilt, and, and arguably still now. Um, and he argued that POTS is the final common pathway of hundreds of genetic and acquired autonomic and cardiovascular entities. So in some ways, a diagnosis of POTS is like a diagnosis of fever, right? Objectively, we have criteria and we can say, yes, you have a fever or no, you don't have a fever. Um, we have a treatment that may help with that. Um, and Kate will talk about, you know, a treatment uh, in a few minutes. Um, but for those of you who've had young young children, you will agree with me that Tylenol can be a wonder drug. I remember when my daughter was uh, under a year old and she uh, developed a temperature of 102 or 103, and she lay on the sofa like a rag doll. And that was very scary because she was usually always moving around. And we gave her a bit of Tylenol and 30 minutes later, her temperature was down to 101 something, so still febrile, still not normal. But she was running around again and her personality had totally changed. It was Tylenol was truly a wonder drug. Paracetamol for those in Europe. Um, truly a wonder drug, right? But that didn't address the issue of why she had the fever. Fever can be due to viral illness, bacterial illness, cancers in some cases, um, metabolic issues. It can be, there's a wide variety of causes. And that's, really the challenge in POTS. So I, I would argue that understanding the pathophysiology of POTS, both the people that research it, but even more broadly the concepts, is like that old parable of the blind man and the elephant. Um, this is something you're probably familiar with. Uh, this is almost ubiquitous uh, in the Indian subcontinent. Every group has a version of this. This is the Hindu version. Um, like a lot of great things from India, uh, a Brit came along, stole it, and took credit for it. And in this case, that was John Godfrey Sachs. But the Hindu version goes like this. It was six men of Hindustan, to learning much inclined, who went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind, that each, by observation, might satisfy his mind. They conclude the elephant is like a wall, a snake, a spear, a tree, fan, or a rope, depending on where they touch. So. In terms of POTS, really, what we're saying is depending on what we bring to it as physicians or as investigators, the tools we have, the experience we have, we see different aspects of it. And that's really one of the challenges, that this doesn't fit into one specialty. The nature of POTS is that it's a multi-system disorder. Um, I've learned some things about gastroenterology. I've learned some things about neurology, but my training is primarily as a cardiologist. And that's the way I view the world. This slide, we're not going to go into this in any detail, but it, it lists just some of the handful of pathophysiologic mechanisms that have been uh, considered and for which there's some data in POTS in some groups of patients. Um, again, um, we can talk more about that if there are questions uh, about some of these specifically. Um, but we don't understand which are the primary drivers and which are secondary, because sometimes these can, also, these can also go together and cluster together. Okay, so then the question is, what do you do? What do you do in terms of investigation and treatment of POTS? The basic evaluation is the basic evaluation for most things. It's a history and physical examination. And I would argue in the case of a patient with POTS, it's actually history, 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 still a little more history, and then a bit of physical examination, right? A lot, the patients will tell you most of what you need to know, but unfortunately it takes time. There's a lot to tell. There's sometimes a lot of frustration over the fact that other doctors haven't 
listen to them. And there's also confusion because it's multi-system as to which things that are going on in their lives you want to know about. Um, so you really need to spend a good amount of time trying to get a handle on that. The second critical issue is, is you need orthostatic vital signs. And you could argue that should be bundled under physical examination, but I know that certainly where we are, most people don't do orthostatic vital signs as a part of their physical examination. But really, you cannot diagnose an orthostatic disorder with criteria based on hemodynamics without measuring it. Um, I think it's worth, and, and a lot of the guidelines recommend some very basic blood tests, a CBC, a complete blood count, uh, a metabolic panel with electrolytes and renal function, and thyroid stimulating hormone to screen for hyperthyroidism as a cause of tachycardia and fatigue. Um, this is a really basic and fairly minimal uh, set of tests and certainly not everything you might want to do, but it's a starting point. And then I would argue that a lot of other tests that you may want to do should be triggered by what you learn in talking to the patient. Um, other tests, you know, could include autonomic reflex tests or formal autonomic cardiovascular tests. We certainly uh, do that uh, in our center, but those uh, centers that can do that are, are fairly limited. Echocardiograms may be useful. I would argue you don't need an echocardiogram. What you need to be able to do is reassure yourself that the heart is structurally normal. And the danger here is that a lot of the presentations of POTS can be mimicked by cardiomyopathy and poor left ventricular function. And in particular, for patients that develop their POTS or apparently develop their POTS uh, during or just after pregnancy, be very wary about something like a peripartum cardiomyopathy mimicking or mimicking POTS because you don't want to miss that. The treatment for the POTS is probably 100% diametrically opposed to the treatment for the peripartum cardiomyopathy. So if you can't do that with history and exam, then get an echocardiogram. Uh, blood volume assessments can be useful. Uh, we found a lot, the majority, but not all. So sort of upwards of 70% of POTS patients can have a low blood volume. Um, and, and if you're going to follow patients over time, sometimes a formal measurement of their exercise capacity can be useful just to track things over time. I'm not going to go into this in, in painful detail, but there's a very uh, nice outline of an autonomic review systems in this article by uh, Brent Goodman from the Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale. The point is you should be thinking not just about the system you're in, in my case, the cardiovascular system with the lightheadedness, but remember the autonomic nervous system, uh, you know, plays roles in uh, sweating. Um, a lot of patients uh, can have problems with dry eyes or dry mouth. There's an association with Sjogren's syndrome and postural tachycardia syndrome. And again, these are things that patients will happily tell you if, if you ask, but they may not think to tell you if you don't ask. Um, a lot of patients describe GI symptoms, always worth asking about that, um, and, and bladder symptoms as well, right? These um, organ systems actually have a strong autonomic component, each of them. This is a busy slide, and I certainly don't plan to walk you all the way through the slide. The slide is mainly here just to point out that it exists. So there's a flow pathway that was developed as part of the Canadian Cardiovascular Society uh, POTS a position statement that I alluded to. The link is here. It is available open access. And this try to put into a context of the initial evaluation and then how You'd have guided evaluations and, and may need to refer to specialists or get specialized testing based on um, sp specific clinical features. And similarly, um, I'm not going to discuss treatments in really any depth, um, except to say there is, again, a flow diagram to help guide you with, based on features of the patient, what you may want to use first line, second line, and uh, then other therapies as you get more desperate. So with that, I'm going to hand this off to Kate. Um, Kate is a, was a master's student who has uh, now become a, a PhD student who's also been admitted to medical school. So she will hopefully be one of our leading uh, clinical investigators in uh, POTS as well as more broadly autonomic uh, physiology for, for decades to come. Kate? Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Raj. Uh, so we'll begin this section with another poll question. And the question is looking at your familiarity with the use of compression garments. So how familiar are you with the use of compression garments as a treatment for POTS? 
And the options are, I did not know that compression garments are a treatment for POTS. I have heard of compression garments as a treatment for POTS, but I have not prescribed them. I have prescribed compression garments as a treatment for POTS, and I regularly prescribe compression garments to POTS patients. I know that some of you may have uh, more or less uh, knowledge and familiarity with compression garments, so we wanted to include a poll question here at the beginning of this section. I also wanted to include this slide looking at fluid shifts when upright. So whether you're a healthy person or you're a patient with POTS, when you stand up, gravity is going to pull blood from your chest down into your abdomen and legs. And so what is shown here uh, in, in this uh, research by Diedrich and Biagioni is looking at fluid shifts when upright. So we know that with resistance or bioimpedance, which was used here, in areas where there's more blood or more fluid, there'll be lower resistance. And in areas where there's less blood, there'll be higher resistance. So we can see in the upper torso, when the person is upright, the resistance increases, indicating a loss of fluid in that area. But in the lower torso, thigh and calf, we can see a decrease in resistance, which indicates a, an increase of fluid in that area. And what we can also see is that in the lower torso, so the abdomen and pelvis area, is where the greatest amount of fluid, uh, fluid is shifted to, um, and then some in the thigh and a, a minimal amount in, in the calf. So as I mentioned, whether or not you're a POTS patient or a healthy person, this fluid shift will happen. Um, but the difference is that in a healthy person, the body can adjust for this, uh, for this fluid shift and you're able to stand without symptoms. Uh, but unfortunately, in patients with POTS, these mechanisms are disrupted, uh, leading to the tachycardia and symptoms that uh, Dr. Raj covered. So that brings us to compression garments. So why compression garments? So uh, as I, I just showed here, there is uh, blood pooling in the lower body. Um, and what's, uh, what's interesting about this is, although as Dr. Rush mentioned, there are likely multiple causes of POTS, uh, this sort of excess blood pooling in the lower body is common across, uh, across the POTS group. So without needing to know the specific pathophysiological mechanism or specific underlying cause, um, compression garments are a treatment that could be applied broadly across the POTS population. The idea behind compression garments is that they provide mechanical external pressure or external squeezing to shift blood that's in the lower body back into the central circulation, so back towards the heart. Um, with the blood that's shifted back towards the heart, uh, preload and stroke volume increase. So this means that the body is able to maintain cardiac output without the need for that excessive tachycardia. Because more blood has returned back to the heart, the heart is able to pump out more blood with each beat, and, and, that, and that tachycardia is not required. But compression garments are actually a frequently prescribed treatment in POTS, uh, but previously there was actually no data indicating whether or not they were actually effective in this patient group. There had been some research looking at uh, other autonomic disorders, uh, orthostatic hypotension that showed some, some promise, but it, it, it wasn't unknown in the adult spot population. So that led us to do uh, this clinical trial here, investigating compression garments in POTS. So as uh, shown in the picture here is uh, the compression garment that we used. This is normally used uh, for postpartum hypovolemia in developing countries. So uh, this is not a garment that we would recommend that people go out and buy, but for our proof of concept study, it was very useful uh, for two reasons. One being that we could do the, gar uh, do this, the garment up uh, in different ways to create different uh, compression conditions. Um, and additionally, it could be used on multiple patients without needing to tailor and size a specific garment, uh, which would have uh, been quite cost prohibitive. So this was a randomized crossover trial of patients diagnosed with POTS. So each uh, POTS patient completed four 10-minute head up tilt tests, each with a different compression garment configuration, which I'll show on the next slide. Uh, and as I mentioned, these were done in a randomized order. Uh, we did use uh, ECG to measure heart rate as well as continuous uh, non-invasive beat to beat blood pressure measurements in this study. In total, we had 30 participants with POTS participate, 28 who were female, uh, their mean age was 32, and their BMI was 24. Uh, and this research was recently published in JAK. Uh, the citation below does include a link to the full paper if you are interested. So this slide here just shows the compression uh, garment configurations that we used in the study. So we had a uh, non-compressionist control, we had a lower leg uh, uh, condition that represented uh, compression socks. 
we had an abdominal condition that represented abdominal sheepwear or compression shorts. And then we had the full uh, condition, which would represent a waist tight tight that a participant might wear. Um, and then again, all participants uh, did all four of these uh, four of these conditions in a randomized order. So jumping here into results. So this is looking at heart rate. Uh, so we can see um, the, the negative numbers are the baseline and then uh, one to 10 is the 10 minutes of tilt. Um, the none is a blue and the full is purple. So we can see that participants had the highest heart rate with no compression and then the lowest heart rate with full compression. Uh, what was really uh, interesting to us and um, not something that we necessarily expected was this sort of a clean dose dependent trend where we can see that with the lower leg compression, heart rate was a little bit better than none. And with the abdominal compression, heart rate was a little bit better than leg and then full uh, better than abdominal. When we look at the heart rate increases, we see a similar trend where with no compression, the heart rate increase was approaching 40 beats per minute. And then with the full compression in purple, we can see that the heart rate increase on head up tilt was actually reduced below that parts, POTS criteria of 30 beats per minute. Um, and again, with the dose dependent trend with uh, each condition just providing a little bit more benefit than the last. We also asked participants about symptoms. Um, it's obviously exciting that we see a heart rate reduction, but if participants are not feeling better, uh, the treatment may not be something that is, is, is very practical or effective. So we use the Vanderbilt Orthostatic Symptom Score, which is nine symptoms rated on a scale of zero to 10. Um, so a bigger number meaning worse symptoms, a lower number meaning improved symptoms. And again, we see in the non-intervention uh, non uh, or control uh, the symptoms were the worst, and then down to the full and purple, the symptoms were uh, rated the best, and then again, a little bit better with each intervention. So exciting that the uh, symptom data is matching is matching our heart rate findings. Uh, additionally, we looked at blood pressure. So this is using the non-invasive B2B blood pressure measurements. And again, we see that uh, dose-dependent trend where in purple full, we see uh, the best preserved blood pressure on upright tilt, and then a none in blue, we see the biggest decrease in blood pressure. And then again, that uh, sort of dose dependent trend. Uh, looking at the delta values on the right hand figure, we can see that for both none and leg, the mean um, blood pressure decrease was about 10 and then a little bit less in abdominal and the best in full. So again, blood pressures as well being better preserved with the compression garment uh, compared to no compression garment. Um, additionally, we looked at stroke volume, and so this is using the waveform analysis from the beat to beat blood pressure. Um, and this is sort of supporting uh, the thought, the idea behind compression garments that if you're able to um, shift blood that is pooled in the lower body back to the central circulation, you're able to increase stroke volume. And so again, we see that in full compression, stroke volume was best preserved, and then in no compression, it was it, it decreased the most. And then again, on the delta values on the right hand side, we see. Um, a larger decrease in stroke volume and none in leg compared to abdominal and full. Uh, so that compression garment is able to uh, preserve stroke volume better um, in these patients. We also wondered um, about different heart rates and compression benefits. So we saw with no compression that our patients actually separated into these three different groups. So on red on the bottom, we have participants whose heart rate increase was less than 30 beats per minute with no compression. Um, all participants were diagnosed with POTS, but some patients were on uh, different medications they weren't able to hold. Uh, so that would sort of account for why there was a group less than 30. Uh, then we had uh, most participants whose heart rate increase was 30 to 50 beats per minute. And then in green, we had this overachiever group of uh, participants who whose heart rate increase was greater than 50. And as, so that led us to the question, does your heart rate increase with no compression um, predict how you might respond to the compression garment? And so we did see that was the case. So on the left hand uh, panel, we just have um, the heart rate increase for each group. So red being less than 30, blue being 30 to 50, and green being 50 plus. And then their heart rate increase with the full compression um, and then on the right hand panel, this is their reduction in um, a reduction in a heart rate increase with the compression garment. So we can see uh, the green and the heart rate greater than 50 group. They had a heart rate reduction of almost 30 beats per minute with the garment compared to about seven um, in the less than 30 group. So this led us to uh, conclude that clinically, if you have a patient with well-controlled tachycardia already, the compression garment may not provide as many benefits as a patient with a really excessive orthostatic tachycardia.
We also asked patients uh, what, what they thought. So we did get their symptom data, but we wanted to know a little bit more. And so here we asked the question, um, how was the compression intervention compared to none? So how did you feel with leg or abdominal or full compared to no compression? We can see with the leg compression, about uh, just under 50% said they felt better with leg compared to none. This increased to above 50% for abdominal compared to none, and then around 80% for full versus none. So definitely um, the full compression patients, more, most patients were feeling better compared to none, but um, still some benefits seen in abdominal as well. So just to conclude uh, this section here, uh, so we were able to show that compression garments did reduce orthostatic tachycardia and improve symptoms in adults diagnosed with POTS. Um, we were also able to show that abdominal compression is an alternative to full lower body compression. So, um, especially in climates that may be warmer, uh, or depending on um, depending on what the patient would like to wear, uh, the full waist high tights may be a bit tricky. And so, the abdominal compression did show good uh, heart rate and symptom uh, benefits. Um, and then we also showed that POTS patients with more orthostatic tachycardia may experience greater benefits in terms of heart rate reduction than patients with less orthostatic tachycardia. And so then uh, what, what are the next steps, uh, next steps here? So uh, as I mentioned, the garment that we used in the study was uh, excellent for our proof of concept evaluation, but it definitely isn't something that we would ever have patients wear in their real life. Uh, so we were going to proceed with a long-term evaluation using commercially available garments in a community setting. So uh, looking at garments that patients might actually wear, and as well looking at a real life, uh, real life experience uh, for these patients. Um, additionally, we're conducting a qualitative study looking at the patient experience with compression garments. Um, obviously, we know that there are some benefits, but there are also some challenges and limitations. So we really wanted to hear from the patients and their voices um, about what their personal experiences were with compression. Uh, so those are our, our next steps moving forward in this area. Um, and now I'll turn it back to Dr. Raj uh, to conclude our presentation. Thank you, uh, Kate. That, uh those data actually very nicely illustrate uh, the benefits of, of really getting advanced hemodynamics during our studies, right? I mean, we very easily could have just looked at heart rate and compression um, that was there, but the addition of the advanced hemodynamics with the blood pressure and being able to estimate stroke volume really did offer us a better explanation as to why we were seeing the benefits. And, and it makes perfect sense when looked at that way. With that, um, I just want to leave you with these take-home messages. Um, ultimately, POTS is a chronic disorder associated with significant functional disability, but it's not a disease. It's not one disease. It's a syndrome. And there may actually be a bunch of diseases with different pathophysiologic mechanisms in different people contributing to that syndrome. That has implications in the future for both prognosis, but also uh, ideally for targeted treatments. But for now, the treatment is largely common and that involves uh, increasing dietary salt and water for the, the patients, um, the use of compression garments early. Um, I've been using that for a few years and, and uh, many patients do find it helpful. It's, it's not the easiest treatment for them to do, but, but you know, if they find benefit, they'll do it. Uh, exercise, we didn't talk about that today, but there's there's lots of good data that exercise is a critical uh, component of therapy, and there was actually a very recent paper uh, that's uh, just come out in Heart Rhythm um, further amplifying this message. Um, and then drugs may be used. We didn't get into the details of, of what those drugs are, um, but they largely fall into drugs that expand blood volume uh, or drugs that work in other ways to control heart rate. And the final thing that I'd leave you with in terms of treatment is that um, all of these patients, these patients that you're seeing are ultimately living with a chronic illness. Um, and that poses many challenges and some do it better than others. Um, I think it's important that we as physicians acknowledge this issue, that we as physicians you know, point out that it's not all about whether it's uh, physiological or whether it's psychological, the reality is these both play off each other and the autonomic nervous system is, is, is really the area where uh, this interplay takes place. Um, and it's important that we give the patient permission to deal with both aspects and not one or the other.
with that, uh, Kate and I are happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Haley. Um, and of course, thank you, Dr. Ross and uh, uh, Ms. Bourne for these uh, excellent presentations. Um, well, so we have a few minutes left to uh, so start uh, quickly with the first question. Um, the first question uh, is uh, for Dr. Raj. Um, what would be the best way to direct physicians who say they know nothing about bots? Where would you point them first? So um, the challenge the challenge with physicians that say they know nothing about POTS is whether they want to know something about POTS or not. Um, and the reality, I wish I could tell you, everyone was eager to learn everything about everything, but that's not true. That's probably not true for me uh, or, or any of the other physicians that are on the call. Um, so they have to be interested. And, and if they are interested, I would suggest a few things. That there are some excellent medical review articles. Um, I can point you to stuff I wrote, but, but perhaps more presciently, there's an article in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology that came out last year uh, out of Texas. There's an article, there are articles written by Arthur Federoski out of Sweden that are all excellent sort of general reviews of POT. Everyone has a slightly different bent or take on it. That's a place to go. But the other quicker place is the, a lot of the patient advocacy groups. So Dysautonomy International uh, in the States, POTS UK in England, um, standing up to POTS, they all have slightly different uh, tools and resources targeting both patients, but also information for their physician that you can take to your physician that is probably shorter and quicker to read. So that's where I'd start. Okay, thank you, Dr. Rush. Um, here is another question. Um, um, what are your projections with regard to POTS and long COVID? I go back to uh, the old Niels Bohr line about predictions are difficult, especially about the future. Um, I think uh, the, at least the initial uh, uh, sense from places that got hit hard with COVID last spring is that there are a lot of patients with long haul COVID or post COVID dysautonomia. And there are definitely patients that developed COVID and then now meet criteria for POTS. Um, what we need to understand is what that is and what that means. Um, in fact, the American Autonomic Society, I think, is working on a position statement to uh, mainly to point this out. I'm not sure that we have any great insights, but I mean, I think there are a lot of questions that need to be answered. Is there something special about COVID causing POTS? Is you know, before COVID, we knew that there are patients who developed their POTS presentation after a viral illness. Is this a more generic viral presentation? Are they different? Um, and this is going to have a resource impact, I think, clinically. I mean, most POTS clinics in North America have very long waiting lists, uh, most autonomic centers. And I think this will extend that. So the hope is that we can increase um, the throughput in clinic. We can increase the number of physicians seeing these patients and trying to help them. Um, and it'll have research implications. And hopefully, we can get funding for un to understand what the true implications are. Yes, so it's very important to have more research and um, get more experience uh, with that in the upcoming uh, period, right? Absolutely. I mean, the research is going to be there are lots of this will raise a lot of questions and uh, it's going to take work and money to find the answers. Yes. OK, thank you. Um, here is another question, um, more on the on the treatment of uh, of patients with POTS. Um, what is the role for IV fluid, fluids uh, in long term management? Um, so I'm going to answer the question two ways, right? I, most a lot of the POTS patients we see are hypovolemic. A lot of our strategies involve um, salt water. Even the compression involves the shifting involves shifting fluid around and increasing blood volume. And saline uh, infusions are a very effective way of acutely increasing blood volume and acutely salt loading, sodium loading. Um, and I'd say that the vast majority of patients, if they're feeling un particularly unwell for whatever reason, um, if they got a liter or two of saline, the vast majority, or well over 90%, um, feel acutely better. The problem is it doesn't last. So the question here, I think, is, well, what about over the long term? Um, and should patients get saline 
repeatedly. In theory, if given in high enough doses, saline can be harmful, but the tr in truth, that usually is not the issue. The problem is getting the saline into the body. Um, if it's a one-off or if it's a, you know, a short-term intervention, you might be able to do this with a purple intravenous catheter. Um, but every time you do that, you lose a bit of that vein and can't access it in the future. And so we enter down a, you know, a path that we've seen many times where patients will go from purple catheters to pick lines to central lines, port -caths often. Um, and the concern is the complication risk from the long-term access. And we've certainly seen many patients with life-threatening complications in many cases. So for that reason, um, long-term saline as a regular therapy is actually a class three indication from different society guidelines, including the Heart Rhythm Society. Um, and class three basically means don't do it routinely. It doesn't mean that there aren't very special and exceptional circumstances where we may want to do it, but the risks may outweigh the reward. Um, and in this case, it's potentially life-threatening risk versus symptomatic reward. Yes, so that's also important to take into account then. Yes. Okay, thank you, Dr. Roche. Um, um, for the sake of time, uh, we will have uh, one more um, question. Um, and um, that is a bit more uh, about the research uh, um, for POTS. Um, so the final question for today is, uh, what are the gaps in the research around non-pharmacological treatments uh, for POTS, in your opinion? Um, a question for uh, Dr. Roche. Is this Oh, yeah, our, our, uh, Kate uh, is welcome to answer it as well, of course. Um, sure, I will start and then uh, Dr. Rush uh, maybe can provide some more information. Um, I think one of the challenges with the non pharmacological managements of POTS is, is just the lack of sort of evidence and research. So with the compression data, um, although compression garments were commonly prescribed, there wasn't actually sort of a, a clinical trial that demonstrated their efficacy. So I think being able to provide uh, sort of evidence to support them, support them and, uh, you know, show that their their valid treatments is, is definitely something uh, to work on in the future. And I'm not sure, Dr. Raj, if you have any additional thoughts. No, I, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, we, we do a lot of things with non-pharmacological approaches, as well as a lot of the pharmacology that are based on poor data, based on, you know, on traditional randomized trial assessments that we all are used to from sort of the other parts of our specialties that doesn't exist. And, and we really need to take a systematic approach to assessing different interventions, right? That's the only way we'll really be able to come up with a good evidence base with which to treat our patients.